Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about the Grignard reaction, which is one of my favorite reactions. But before we get into that, let's talk through some of the practice problems I assigned last lecture. First, we have this ketone, and we treat it with tosyl hydrazine. Initially, the NH2 of the tosyl hydrazine attacks at the ketone. This then allows the electrons on the ketone to swing up on the oxygen, and via proton transfer, we form this hydroxy group. Via the elimination of this hydroxy group as water via a subsequent proton transfer and the electron density of this nitrogen onto this carbon forms this N double bond C, which is a tosyl hydrazone because we have a tosylate type group, a tosyl group connected to this nitrogen. In the next problem, we take acetophenone and treat it with 1,3-propanediol in the presence of a strong acid catalyst, which is tosic acid. Initially, the acetophenone gets protonated, which then activates the carbonyl for nucleophilic attack by the propane diol. The electrons swing up onto the oxygen, forming this hemiketal intermediate. Via the elimination of water through proton transfer, we form this oxonium species, which can then be intramolecularly trapped through this free hydroxy group, forming this ketal product. Now, these types of ketals are very common protecting groups, so this is a useful mechanism to remember so that you know how they're prepared. Before we get into today's material, I wanted to introduce a few additional reagents that might be worth knowing. The first one is select fluor, and this is an electrophilic fluorinating agent. Now, what I say, what I mean when I say electrophilic fluorinating agent, I mean it acts as if it's a source of F+, which means that it can add fluorine to certain nucleophiles. Uh, this reagent is actually quite common in organic synthesis, and I've actually met Bob Sivret, the guy who helped develop it. The next reagent I want to talk about is Lawson's reagent, which is a thionating agent. And what Lawson's reagent is good at is converting carbonyl compounds into their thiocarbonyl counterparts. However, if you ever work with this compound, it's quite smelly, and if you're not careful with it, it can, produ it can produce hydrogen sulfide, which is very toxic. The last compound I wanted to note was Tosmic, which is this tosyl isocyanide, and this reagent is good at converting ketones into nitriles, as well as converting aldehydes into imidazoles and oxazoles. And so with that, let's get into today's material, the addition of Grignard reagents. So Grignard reagents can react with a number of different carbonyl-containing functional groups, but the way that they're prepared is through the treatment of an alkyl, aryl, vinyl, or alkynyl halide with magnesium powder in an ethereal solvent, producing this, which is known as a Grignard reagent. Here you can see an example with an aryl group, and here you can see examples with a vinyl or an alkynyl group. The most common solvents that are used for this transformation tend to be 1,4-dioxane, THF, or diethyl ether. Sometimes mixtures of these are used, depending on the application. So some things to think about when you're doing this reaction is that magnesium that we showed here sometimes will form an oxide layer because free metallic magnesium will react with oxygen in the air. So it can form magnesium oxide or magnesium hydroxide if that oxide reacts with water. So to get the reactions going really well, it's important, one, to use magnesium powder instead of just solid magnesium on its own. But there's a couple ways that you can activate the magnesium, such as sonicating the magnesium powder in your solvent. So if you have a sonicator in your lab, you can sonicate the magnesium powder. That makes it a little bit more reactive, and that helps break off oxygen, uh, oxidized magnesium. Another thing you can do is grind the magnesium powder in a mortar and pestle immediately before you use it. Sometimes people also grind in solvent, but as magnesium's uh, pyrophoric, you have to be careful if you're going to do that. You can use an anhydrous solvent, which you should do most of the time when you're doing Grignard chemistry anyway. Now, I've had personal experience using non-dried solvent, and it can usually work fine. It just depends on how finicky the Grignard reagent is. Um, another thing you can do is add in a catalytic amount of iodine or a drop of 1,2-diiodoethane. And what this will do is react with the magnesium to make magnesium iodide, and that can just help get things going. That's a common trick that people use. One last trick is heating the solution. Sometimes if it's being really stubborn, having the reaction stirring uh, and heating can sometimes help things break up and start going. And once the Grignard reaction begins, you'll know that it's going. And so you usually want to have this set up with a reflux condenser just in case it starts running away and going too quickly. It'll go from room temperature to boiling to you can barely control it if you're doing it in diethyl ether. So... Uh, the, in general, the reaction that you'll see with Grignard reagents is addition, the 1,2 addition to a carbonyl. So here we have a carbonyl, generic carbonyl compound. The Y group could be a leaving group, or it might be something that's retained in the product. So the types of products you can obtain would be alcohols, ketones, or further substituted alcohols. And so 
This is one of the most powerful reactions in organic chemistry, and it tends to have decent chemoselectivity, as you'll see in some examples later. So first we'll talk about aldehydes. Aldehydes tend to be the most electrophilic electrophile for Grignard reagents to add to. So in the presence of multiple different uh, electrophilic carbonyl containing groups, aldehydes will preferentially react first most of the time. And so one example from a patent that I found was this complex aldehyde here reacts with this aryl Grignard reagent, forming this secondary alcohol product. Now you can see there's quite a lot of functional groups here and any acidic nitrogens will likely get deprotonated by the Grignard reagent as well, because even though Grignard reagents are good nucleophiles, they're also good bases. So if we have acidic protons in our molecule, we need to add additional equivalents of Grignard reagent or add in a base to remove any of the acidic protons first. Now, this is formed in a very good yield, even though it was in the presence of an amide, which might potentially react. We could also add these uh, Grignard reagents to ketones. And so if we add a Grignard reagent to a ketone, we get a tertiary alcohol. One example I found from a patent was this complex ketone here, where the Grignard reagent adds and it tolerates all of these different heterocyclic uh, moieties and some interesting functional groups in OK yield. Now, when we have esters, because there's an alkoxy group, this alkoxy group is actually a good leaving group. And so instead of just adding once and affording the ketone like you might expect, these Grignard reagents can actually add twice. And so you'll get tertiary alcohols the same way that you get if you react a Grignard reagent with a ketone, because we're forming a ketone as an intermediate. Now, esters aren't that reactive. So these reactions usually need to be done at reflux. Um, and additionally, uh, you're going to be unable to isolate the ketone intermediate. And this is because the ketone is more reactive than an ester. So as it's formed, it reacts faster than the unreacted starting material reacts. So one of the things you have to consider is if you want to make a ketone, you're going to have to consider using alternative methodology that we'll talk about in a minute. But first, let's talk about this example that I found in the literature. Here we have this ethyl ester with a free diethyl acetal. The Grignard reagent selectively displaces the alkoxy group of the uh, ester, but then a second equivalent adds, forming this tertiary alcohol. They then deprotect this and convert it into an aldehyde in subsequent steps, but as this isn't the focus of today's lecture, I'm going to continue. Now, the mechanism of this reaction is as follows. Um, you can apply this to the mechanism of all Grignard reactions because they tend to follow the same mechanism. Initially, the carbonyl uh, chelates to the magnesium because magnesium 2 is a good Lewis acid. Um, this carbonyl will want to coordinate it. Once it's coordinated, that activates the carbonyl carbon for nucleophilic attack. And through a shift process, the alkyl group or aryl group, the carbon containing nucleophile on the Grignard, is able to transfer and attack that carbonyl. Once that occurs, the magnesium acts more as a cation rather than a covalently bound species as it previously was in the case of the organometallic. Now this alkoxide is able to collapse down, uh, eliminating off this alkoxy group, which will coordinate to the magnesium. This ketone can then undergo the same process, coordinating another time, adding another R group, and affording this alkoxide product. In acidic workup, we're afforded with the tertiary alcohol. So one solution to get around the problem that esters have where you can't stop at ketones is to use something called a Weinreb amide. Now, Weinreb amides are a useful solution to this problem. And what happens is once the Grignard reagent adds, if this is done at a low temperature, the magnesium forms a chelate to the oxygen of the amide, this, this fancy alkoxy uh, amine, as well as to the alkoxide species. And so this will be stable and it will prevent any subsequent nucleophiles from adding in. If we treat this with water and a weak acid at a low temperature, then we'll get the uh, ketone out. Now here's one interesting example that I found in the literature, where we take this Weinreb amide, treat it with vinyl magnesium bromide, and we're afforded with this alpha beta unsaturated ketone. Now this is a useful trick to keep in your back pocket, because these things tend to be relatively unstable, but very useful synthetically. Another approach is to just convert a ketone to an aldehyde and then treat it with an oxidant. And so what you can do is you can just take a generic aldehyde, treat it with a Grignard reagent and acid. This will give you a secondary alcohol, and then you can oxidize that secondary alcohol up to a ketone. And sometimes this can give better yields, uh, or if you don't want to use a Weinreb amide, if all you can access is an aldehyde for some reason, this could be a useful way to get around that problem. But it's useful to know both, as they both have lots of application in organic synthesis. One other approach that you can consider is the use of a nitrile. So if you take a nitrile and treat it with a Grignard reagent, 
The same sort of thing happens where the nitrogen coordinates now instead of the oxygen in the case of carbonyls, which then activates the carbon of the nitrile for nucleophilic attack, the R group shifts over, and through subsequent hydrolysis, we're afforded with this ketone. And so this nitrile adduct is stable at low temperatures as magnesium amide, which would be uh, like a nitrogen three minus magnesium two plus species would be a very poor leaving group. And so this is another solution to that problem. Now here's one example where we take this interesting uh, bicyclic species, uh, treat it with a Grignard reagent, and we're afforded with this ketone. Another useful trick is if you want to do a one carbon extension of a carbon containing chain, you can treat a Grignard reagent with carbon dioxide. And so that would convert a Grignard reagent into a one carbon homologue, which is, uh, it's like the same shape, but it's one carbon longer with a carboxyl group on the end. And so one example that I found in the literature was taking this alkynyl tin species, treating it with CO2, and through subsequent hydrolysis, they're afforded with this tin-containing, alkyne-containing uh, carboxylic acid. Although I wasn't able to find the DOI for this because it's from an older issue of a Russian Journal of uh, General Chemistry. So for this lecture, I'd like to assign two practice problems. First, propose a Grignard reagent for the following transformation. Uh, actually, I'm going to assign a third problem in a minute, too. In this next example, I'd like you to do a similar exercise, propose a Grignard reagent for the following transformation. And in this final one, I want you to show the product of what we would get when we react this ester derivative of cubane with methyl magnesium bromide in 1,4-dioxane. And when you're doing this, I want you to show the mechanism of this reaction as well. And so with that, I hope this has been useful for you. If you have any questions, I'd encourage you to leave them below. If you have any comments or feedback about how the series is going, I'd be happy to hear them in the comments. And with that, I hope you have a great day. Thank you.